Hello everyone, welcome to the third session of GE8. This session is particularly an introduction to ethics. In this presentation, we shall discuss the following topics. First, we shall discuss the definition of ethics. And then second, we shall explore on the three general subject areas of ethics, namely meta-ethics, normative ethics, and applied ethics. And then under each subject area, we shall also explore on the intricacies of the following uh, division or subdivision of ethics. For example, under meta-ethics, we shall discuss egoism and altruism, emotion and reason, male and female morality. And then under normative ethics, we shall discuss virtue theories, duty theories, and consequentialist theories. And then under applied ethics, we shall discuss the different issues involved in applied ethics. So that at the end of this presentation, the students will have a clear overview or a clear understanding of what ethics is, what it means, and what it covers. So we start off with the definition of of ethics. The first definition that I have here is taken from the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy and it says ethics, which is also known as moral philosophy, involves in systematizing, defending, and recommending concepts of right and wrong behavior. So by studying ethics, we will be able to learn the different principles and theories that will guide us in judging or in evaluating whether a certain behavior is right or wrong. However, ethics does not prescribe on a particular theory or principle. What we shall do for the entire semester is as an instructor, I will explain the different ethical theories and principles, but never will I prescribe a specific kind of principle that you all should follow. Because at the end of the day, we should have the freedom to, to choose or to decide which principle or which theory is for us more convincing than the other. Nevertheless, ethics will help us understand the concepts of right and wrong behavior. Now, another definition is from Britannica.com and it says, ethics is the discipline concerned with what is morally good and bad and morally right and wrong. So the first and second definitions are closely related to each other because it uses the word right and wrong. Now the third definition is ethics refers to the, to the basic concepts and fundamental principles of decent human conduct. So ethics will help us understand the principles and the theories that govern decent human conduct. What is it like to have a decent human life? Or what is it like to have a good life? And to answer that question, we need to learn about ethics. So basically, and in simple terms, ethics deals with concepts with, and principles regarding right and wrong behavior. Ethics is a very broad branch of philosophy. That's why there are at least three subdivisions of ethical theories, namely meta-ethics, normative ethics, and applied ethics. And we will discuss these one at a time. So we start with meta ethics. The word meta means beyond. So meta ethics deals with the origin of our moral concepts and the meaning 
of our moral concepts. When we say origin of moral concepts, it tries to answer the question, where do our concepts of morality come from? Or who told us that this one is right and this one is wrong? And what does it mean to say that this one is good? Or what comprises the word good? When do we say that a good conduct is good? And when can we say that a bad conduct is bad? Now, those are the concerns of metaethics. It tries to look at the origin and the meaning of our moral concepts. So there are two issues which are prominent in metaethics, namely metaphysical issues and psychological issues. Now, under metaphysical issues, it concerns whether morality exists independently of humans. It tries to answer the question, who created morality? Or who says that this one is moral and this one is not moral? Do humans create morality? Or is it God who created morality? So those are the, the two opposing concepts or issues under metaphysical uh, aspect of metaethics, which we shall explore in a little while. Another general category of metaethics is the so-called psychological issues. Now, it concerns the underlying mental basis of our moral judgments and conduct. So, this discusses the, the opposing poles between emotion and reason, which we shall also discuss later. So let's take a look first at the metaphysical issues. Under metaphysical issues, there are two general views that we shall discuss. The first view is the otherworldly view. Now this view explains that Moral values are objective and absolute. When we say objective, it is the same from one person to another. And when we say absolute, it's unquestionable. And when we say eternal, it doesn't change from one time to another time. And the other worldly view also believes that moral values are also universal. When we say universal, it is true to these people in this country or in this culture and it's also true to another group of people in another country and in another culture. One proponent of the other worldly view is the ancient Greek philosopher Plato who believes that moral values are absolute truths and spiritual objects. When we say absolute truths, they are certain. They never, they never change. And we can never question the certainty of these truths because these are absolute truths. Another philosopher who supported the other worldly view is William of Ockham who believes that God wills moral principles and God informs humans of these divine commands by implanting us with moral intuition or so-called conscience. So the other worldly view believes that God is the ultimate source of our moral ideas. And since God is the source of our moral concepts and our moral ideas, these moral concepts, ideas, and values are therefore objective, absolute, eternal, and universal because of the fact that they are not created by humans, but rather they are created by God. The other side of the coin is called this worldly view. Now this worldly view 
argues that moral values are not objective but rather subjective. And one philosopher who subscribed to that idea is Sextus Impericus, who bluntly denies the objective status of moral values. So in the other world review, people who subscribe to this view believe that moral values are objective. They never change. However, in this world review, specifically in the context of Sextus Empiricus' argument, he denies the, the objective status of moral values. In other words, moral values are subjective. Meaning to say, moral values are not created by God, but rather they are created by humans. In fact, the skeptics argued that moral values are strictly human inventions. A while ago, when we discussed other worldly view, I was saying, we were saying that moral values are created by God. They are given by God. However, in this worldly view, we say that moral values are created or invented by humans. And since we think differently, that's why we have the so-called moral relativism. What is good for me may not be good for you. Or what is good for you may not be good for me. Because of the fact that under this worldly view, moral values are not objective and absolute and universal, but rather subjective. It differs from one person to another, from one country to another, from one culture to another. That is why moral relativism will account or will give us an explanation why certain countries legalize this or believe this to be moral, while other countries believe this thing to be immoral. Now, under moral relativism, we shall discuss individual relativism and cultural relativism. Now, individual relativism means, based on what I said a while ago, I am my own standard. I create my own standard of morality. I create my own moral values. And since it is the human person who creates the moral concepts, the moral values, and the moral principles, there is a high tendency that it will differ to the principles and to the values of other persons. Hence, the so-called individual relativism. What is good for me may not be good for you, and what is good for you may not be good for me. Another concept under moral relativism is the so-called cultural relativism. This explains why certain cultures have a certain set of moral values which are opposing or contrary or different to the set of moral values in another culture. Okay. So again, we have moral relativism, individual relativism, individual people create their own moral standards. So we become the creator of our own moral standards or moral values. Not God, but human beings. The one philosopher prominent in this view regarding individual relativism under moral relativism is Friedrich Nietzsche, who argued that superhuman creates his or her morality distinct from and in reaction to the slave-like value system of the masses. Now, in the philosophy of Friedrich Nietzsche, he distinguishes between 
master morality and slave morality. And master morality is the morality of the strong, while slave morality is the morality of the weak. And obviously, master morality or the morality of the strong is better than the morality of the weak or slave morality. No, master morality will teach us the, the ideas like we have to be we have to, to be assertive. We have to know who we are and be who we are and be what be what we must be. Okay? So another is cultural relativism. That morality is grounded in the approval of one society. So unlike individual relativism, where if we are only talking about specific persons and specific individuals, this time in cultural relativism, moral values are agreed and arrived at not specifically by each person, but by each society or by each culture which is composed of a group of persons or individual human beings. This view was advocated by Sextus Empiricus and in more recent centuries by Michel Montaigne and William Graham Summer. So it's good to know that under moral relativism, specifically this is under this world view which believes that humans are the creators or the inventors of human values. Moral relativism as an idea is being introduced and moral relativism is further categorized into individual relativism which argues that specific human beings and specific individuals create and invent their own moral standard while cultural relativism argues that moral standards and moral values are agreed upon by a certain culture or a certain society which is composed of a certain group of individuals or persons. Okay, we proceed now to the question, why do we behave or why do we conduct ourselves in a good way? Now, this is one of the questions being addressed in metaethics. Okay. Why in the first place do we behave in a good way? Why do we follow rules? Now, in this time of pandemic, why do we wear face masks? Why do we wear face shield? Why do we wash our hands? Now, metaethics wants to explore the, the very reasons of our moral behaviors. Do you wear mask or do you wear face shield because you want to avoid punishment? Now in the national capital region, one city imposes 3,000 pesos as a penalty if you are caught not wearing your face mask in public places or in public spaces. Or do you wear mask because you want to gain praise? Or do you do good things because you want to gain praise? Or do you conduct yourselves morally because you want to attain happiness? Or you want to be dignified? Or you want to fit in with society? Because there are instances wherein if we deviate from what is socially acceptable, we might be condemned by the society. Okay, for example, uh, same-sex relationship is not yet accepted legally and morally in the Philippines, but it is being practiced by some people. But the Philippine culture is not yet totally tolerant of same-sex relationship more so with same-sex marriage. That is why 
people who are into same-sex relationship are considered as deviant in the society because this is not the kind of marriage and this is not the kind of relationship that is totally acceptable in the Philippines unlike in other countries in which it is considered as as legal and it's considered as as moral so aside from metaphysical issues another issues under under meta ethics are psychological issues now one major idea that we need to explain here is the difference between egoism and altruism. What motivates us to do good? Thomas Hobbes said that many, if not all, of our actions are prompted by selfish desires. Even if an action seems selfless, there are still selfish causes for this. Now, this is called psychological egoism. Now, Thomas Hobbes is boldly saying that all the things that we do, or most of the things that we do, are motivated by selfish desires. No matter how good an act is, it always has a selfish desire, according to Thomas Hobbes. Some politicians during campaigns, during election campaigns, do make something to people. Now we, we try to, to ask ourselves, are they doing that because they are good by themselves or they have a good heart or they have a kind heart now we may say no because some politicians or some political candidates during campaigns have donation drives because they want to gain the votes of the people and so strictly speaking their act no matter how good it may be, it still has a selfish desire because they want to translate their donations into votes that will gain them a seat in the government. Okay? So another is the simple act of helping other people. If we are going to use the argument of Thomas Hobbes, if we help other people, it may be good. However, some of us, consciously or unconsciously, help other people because we want some time later or in the future, those people, we want those people to also help us in times when we would need their help. And so in the end, and strictly speaking, helping others, even if it may appear to be selfless, but consciously or unconsciously, it still has a selfish desire because by helping others, you also want other people to help you when you would need their help. Right. But I tell you, this idea of Thomas Hobbes that our actions are always motivated by selfish desires is somehow very difficult to accept. Because some of us have been accustomed to think that when we do good, we are doing it for its own sake. But Thomas Hobbes is saying that everything we do actually has a personal or self 
benefit or we do everything for our self-interest. For example, you want to, to study in college and earn a degree because you want to help your parents in the end. But whether you like it or not, before you can help your parents, you have to help yourself first. And so, helping others arguably comes only after we have helped ourselves. And so, your intention to study, earn a degree, and work in the future, have a salary or an income with the intention of helping others, actually has a benefit of the self. Hence, the idea of Thomas Hobbes called psychological egoism. So, psychological egoism entails that self-oriented interests ultimately motivate all human action. So, we cannot divorce or we cannot separate moral actions from self-oriented interest or self-interest. Because psychological egoism would alert you that no matter how self-disinterested an action may be, it somehow has a benefit of the self. Now another related concept is known as psychological hedonism. Now the key word for hedonism for the word that we can associate with hedonism is the word pleasure. Psychological hedonism entails that pleasure is the specific driving force behind all of our actions. We do this because we are happy doing so. We help others because we are happy to see that we have helped others. Or we we go to school, we attend classes because we gain happiness or we gain pleasure. We try to have girlfriends or boyfriends. We marry someone. We have we aspire to have kids because we believe that having a girlfriend or a boyfriend, a wife or a husband or having kids will give us a certain pleasure or happiness. Okay. So, psychological hedonism, in other words, believes that pleasure or satisfaction is the one that drives us to do things. Now another concept under egoism and altruism is psychological altruism by Joseph Butler. Now Thomas Hobbes is saying that there is always an ego or there is a self that we are always thinking of every time we do something. And psychological hedonism is capitalizing on the idea that we do things out of pleasure or we do things because we gain a pleasurable experience by doing so. Now on the other hand, Joseph Butler is thinking differently. He's not talking of the self. He's not talking about self-interest. He's not talking about selfish desires. Nor is he talking about pleasures. He is talking about our instinct to be good to others, our instinct to be gentle, to be kind, to be generous to others. And this is what he calls as psychological altruism. That it's possible for us to think not only of ourselves, but to think about all else of others. Okay, so 
So once again, that's uh, egoism versus altruism. In summary, egoism would like to argue that the ego, the self-interest, the selfish desire, and pleasure are the forces that drive us to do, to do, to do things. On the other hand, altruism is saying that we have the instinctive benevolence or the, the heart to do good things for others. Now, another issue that we need to explore is the issue on emotion and reason. Now, which between the two pushes us to do good things? Is it emotion or reason? When you find someone on the street, a hungry person, a hungry child, begging for food, and you have a food with you, and you gave that food to that hungry child, we ask ourselves, which between reason and emotion tells us to donate or to give that food to the child? Is it emotion or reason? Is it because we feel pity to the child who is hungry, that's why we give the food? Or would you rather believe that it's not emotion, but rather it's the mind? It's our rationality. It's our instinct to help. Now this is one of the issues under psychological issues. David Young will argue that emotions come to play in our moral assessments. Hence he said that moral assessments involve our emotions and not our reason. We need a distinctly emotional reaction in order to make a moral pronouncement. When you say that abortion should not be practiced because it's immoral, such pronouncement or such statement that you abhor abortion or you judge abortion to be an immoral practice, according to David Lowe, is a product of our emotions. You may disagree or disfavor abortion because you feel pity to the life of the fetus that we are trying to kill. That's why you say that abortion is immoral. So we cannot separate emotions from our moral assessments. When you say that rape, murder, and other crimes should be penalized accordingly, these pronouncements or these ideas came about as far as David Young is concerned, because of the interplay of our emotions. We abhor rape or we disagree with rape because in the very first place, we know what is it like when you are being raped based on what we see on TV or we heard over the radio. That it's never easy to be a rape victim. That's why we go against rape. And so such pronouncement that rape is immoral is a product of our moral assessments which involve emotion. Another philosopher in the person of Ayer also supports the idea of David Young. 
Just like Dendrion, Ayer is also anti-rationalist. When we say anti-rationalist, he, he goes against reason as the force that drives us to determine or to decide one thing to be moral or immoral. Because just like you, Ayer is convinced that emotions influence our actions or the way we view things. He denied that moral assessments are factual descriptions. Example, the statement, it is good to donate to charity. It actually has two elements, emotive element and prescriptive element. When we say it is good to donate to charity, there is an emotion involved because we feel pity to those people in, in charity institutions. At the same time, our act of donating to charity is an indirect way of saying that others should follow suit or others should do the same thing. So there is a prescriptive element in our, uh, in our acts. On the contrary, while Jung and Ayer are convinced that emotions influence our moral assessments, Immanuel Kant, a modern philosopher, contradicted with that idea. Because for him, emotions should not and are not factors that should affect our, uh, our moral assessments. But what for him motivates us to do good or to be moral is not emotion, but only reason. No emotions and no desires involved, but rather reason. For example, if you use the same example, if you see a hungry child on the street and you have a food with you, Jung and Ayer will say that you have to feel pity to this child. And since you have a food and he, the, the child is hungry, so you give the food to the child. And such act is driven by our emotions. However, Kant is saying that moral actions should be driven not by emotions but by reason. We give the food to the hungry child because the mind dictates that it is the right thing to do. The danger, as far as Immanuel Kant is concerned, the danger when we use emotion as the motivator of our good actions is that what if there is a time that calls us to help someone yet we don't feel we don't have the desire to help we don't like to help like is an emotion liking is an emotion so that's the problem with Jung and Ayer's philosophy that if we depend on emotion Emotions are fleeting. Emotions are temporary. But reason, if you see the reason to do good, you will also, you will always do it regardless of the situation. So that's the view of Immanuel Kant. He contradicted Jung and Ayer in his idea that true moral action is motivated not by emotion, but only by reason. Bayer also focuses more broadly on the reasoning and argumentation process that takes place when making moral choices. So, Bayer, unlike Yo, Ayer, and Kant, is rather focusing on the process, the reasoning and argumentation process of our moral choices. 
For example, if I claim that it is wrong to steal someone's car, then I should be able to justify my claim with some kind of argument that for every moral choice that we have, there is actually a moral decision making that is going on. That when we choose one course of action over the other, we help or we don't help, we become loyal, loyal or not loyal, we be honest or not honest, there is always a certain reasoning or argumentation that takes place. For example, if you choose to help, we always have a reason. Or, or if we don't help, if we choose not to help, there is, there is always a, a certain reason for such choice. So Bayer is primarily focusing on the kind of argument we have for our moral choices. Some of us may favor abortion, some may not. Some may favor same-sex marriage, some may not. Some may favor death penalty, some may not. But Bayer is not concerned about that, but he's concerned that in every moral choice that we have, there is always a reasoning and argumentation process that takes place. We always have arguments why we believe this to be so and this to be to be otherwise. So this is the emotion and reason issue. Now the last issue under psychological issues is male and female morality. Now generally, if we look at history, particularly Philippine history, we know that males are the one, were the ones who, who earn a living. They are the ones who are considered as providers of the family. Traditionally, fathers are considered as providers. They are considered as decision makers in the family, traditionally. While women or females or wives are usually confined in the house, traditionally or in the past, women or wives don't make a living outside of the house, but rather they take charge of household chores. They look, up, they look after the welfare of their children. They care for their children. And so with that, with that fact at hand, there is another issue under psychological issues that is worth looking into. That's the male and female morality that the personalities of male and female can be a good source of a certain moral principle. And one very obvious uh, fact is that since wives stay at home, takes care of the children, brings about the idea of care. Okay? We, though we are not saying that husbands are not carers or they don't care at all for their children, but we are saying that wives or women are involved directly and personally in taking care of the children. And so there goes the concept of care or the morality of care. Women have traditionally had a nurturing role by raising children and overseeing domestic lives. Less rule following and more creative action. Using the women's experience as a model for moral theory, then the basis of morality would be spontaneously caring for others as would be appropriate in each circumstance. So male and female morality awakens us to the reality that we should be caring for others. 
We should not only care for ourselves. We should not only care for our own welfare. We should not only care for our own existence, but rather, we should also care for others. We should care for others equally as we care for ourselves. So that's the, the takeaway from male and female morality. Okay, so we're through with metaphysical issues and psychological issues of metaethics. Now, another general subject area under ethics is normative ethics. Now, if you notice, metaethics investigates the origin of our moral concepts or our moral values. Reason, emotion, this worldly, otherworldly. But normative ethics is more practical. For the reason that it wants to arrive at moral standards that regulate right and wrong conduct. It wants to articulate good habits that we should acquire the duties that we should follow, or the consequences of our behavior on others. So normative ethics is more practical in a sense that it wants to outline what the good habits are and what duties do we have that we need to follow and the consequences of our behaviors. Normative ethics involves arriving at moral standards that regulate right and wrong conduct. In a sense, it is a search for an ideal litmus test of proper behavior. So normative ethics will introduce us to the different theories that will help us to evaluate a certain act to be right or wrong. For example, is the golden rule. The golden rule is a classic example of normative ethics. Now, why? Because the, the golden rule, which says, do unto others what you want others do unto you, and do, not do unto others what you don't want others do unto you, can be a good moral principle that will guide our moral conducts or guide our moral decision making. That if you don't want other people to backbite you or to steal your property, then you should not backbite or steal their properties. And so, stealing and backbiting others are not good at all because they don't or they are not in congruence to the, the principle of the golden rule. So the golden rule is an example of the normative theory that, that establishes a single principle against which we judge all our actions. Now we can actually use the golden rule in judging all our actions. That if you want people to treat you right, then you should also treat them right. Okay? So that's a very uh, it's a very common sense thing that if you want people to help you when you would be in need, then you should help them when they would be in need. So the golden rule actually can be a good moral principle by which we judge our actions that if you do something yet you cannot afford other people to do that same thing to you then there is something wrong with the act okay so the key assumption in normative ethics is that there is only one ultimate criterion of moral conduct whether it is a single rule or a set of principles so, 
Three strategies will be noted here, namely virtue theories, duty theories, and consequentialist theories. So, theories in ethics, specifically those that fall under normative ethics, can be categorized into three major headings. Virtue theories, duty theories, and consequentialist theories. The virtue theories will recommend or will outline certain, certain virtues that we need to possess. While duty theories will outline the different duties that we need to follow. And consequentialist theories want to explore on the consequences of our conducts or our behaviors. And we will explain this one by one. So let's start with virtue theories. Virtue ethics or virtue theories place less emphasis on learning rules and instead stresses the importance of developing good habits of character. Now this is one of the reasons why normative ethics is more practical in nature than meta-ethics. Plainly because normative ethics, particularly virtue ethics or virtue theories, it places less emphasis on learning good habits. It's never enough that you know the good. What is enough is you do the good or you develop good habits of character. Now that is the, one of the main concerns or the main objectives of virtue theories. That we don't only know what is good, but we do what is good. One proponent of virtue ethics is Plato and he emphasized on four virtues namely wisdom, courage, temperance, and justice. Wisdom, courage, temperance, and justice are the habits of character that we all must develop in ourselves. And another important virtues are fortitude, generosity, self-respect, good temper, and sincerity. So again, normative ethics, ex example of which is the virtue theories, you see it's more practical. Why? Because we are given a set of virtues that we all must develop, just like the philosophy of Plato. In addition to advocating good habits of character, virtue theorists hold that we should avoid acquiring bad character traits, or what Plato calls as vices. Vices such as cowardice, insensibility, injustice, and vanity. Vanity is defined as uh, pride or high importance that we give to physical appearance and our self-achievements. So we should avoid at all costs developing these vices, namely cowardice, insensibility, injustice, and vanity. Moral theory emphasizes moral education since virtuous character traits are developed in one's youth. In one's youth. Adults, therefore, are responsible for instilling virtues in the young. That's why, if you can remember, as early as elementary years, there is a subject about developing good values or good habits that is influenced by the philosophy of Plato who believes on the importance of moral education that as, as early as possible 
In fact, at home, morality should begin. And who should teach morality to the youth? It's the adults. That's why it's very difficult to teach morality to, to, to children, or it's hard for adults to teach morality to children if adults themselves are acting contrary to what morality accepts to be moral. It's hard to teach, it's hard for an adult to teach a child not to smoke, not to take prohibited drugs if the adult himself is taking drugs. So he is somehow contradicting himself. And aside from Plato, Aristotle also has a virtue theory which is known as the the Nicomachean ethics in which he argued that to be moral we have to avoid excess and deficiency rather we have to stay in the middle or what he calls as mean but we will discuss this in the, the next session now we move on to duty theories now duty theories primarily believe that we have a certain duty to perform we have a certain obligation to do hence duty theories based morality on specific foundational principles of obligation duty theories are sometimes called deontological from the Greek word deon which means duty and duty theories are non-consequentialist when we say non-consequentialist duty theories don't look at the consequences because once you consider something to be your duty as, or your obligation regardless of the consequences you must perform your duty for example if you can remember the one of the dilemmas one of the ethical or moral dilemmas i shared with you during the first session was the accidental samaritan you hit a person and that person died yet one person is convinced that he killed the person and not you and so the question there was are you going to tell the truth that you were the one who killed the person or you would rather let the person take responsibility you notice that if you tell the truth you will tell the truth that you were the one who killed the person there is a big possibility that you will go to jail but you know that going to jail will curtail your freedom on the other hand if you don't tell the truth and you let the person take responsibility of the of the death of that person then you you free yourself from going to jail yet you are letting another person be a suspect of a crime that he or she did not do now going back to duty theories duty theories are non-consequentialist because if you let duty theorists answer the accidental Samaritan they will choose the option that says that you have to tell the truth even if telling the truth will send you to jail because again duty theories don't look at the consequences they look at the duties that we need to perform and duty theorists believe for example that telling the truth is an obligation that telling the truth is a duty even though it so will resolve or will cause to the 
the, the curtailment of your freedom or liberty, then you have to, to perform your duty since it is your obligation to tell the truth and be honest. Now, four central duty theories are from Samuel Puffindarf, another is from John Locke, another from Immanuel Kant, of course, and, and the last is from, from Ross. And we will explore this in, in future sessions. Okay, uh, Puffindarf is one of the proponents of duty theories, or he has a duty theory. And he classified dozens of duties under three headings, namely duties to God, duties to oneself, and duties to others. Our duties to God are as follows, to know the existence and nature of God, and to inwardly and outwardly worship God. The duties towards ourselves is to develop our skills and talents. That's one duty. Another is our duty not to harm our bodies and not to kill oneself. So just that's a duty. Another is the duty towards others. Avoid wronging others. Treat people as equals and promote the good of others. So these are the, the duties outlined by Samuel Puffindarf. Another uh, duty theorist is John Locke with his rights theory. Now John Locke argued that right is a justified claim against another person's behavior, such as my right to not be harmed by you. For example, I have the right to life. Our right to life obliges others not to harm us because we have the right to life. And other people's right to life also obliges us to respect such right to life. And so, the concept of right is related to the concept of duty. Because every right, our every right or every right that we have has a corresponding duty to another person. For example, you borrowed money from me. Since I own that money, I have the right to get that money back. And you have the duty to pay the money that you borrowed from me. So hence, there is a correlation between rights and duties. We have the right to live in this country, but we also have the duty to pay our taxes. That's a very classic example. We have the right to, to live. Other people have the right to live too. And so in this time of pandemic, being hygienic or observing health protocols is our duty because if we don't practice health measures or if we don't follow health measures it will endanger the right to life and the right to health of others so there is always a correlation between rights and duties as argued by John Locke John Locke also argued that the laws of nature mandate that we should not harm anyone's life, health, liberty, or possession. So this is what I was saying to you. For love, there are four natural rights given to us by God. And 
rights or moral rights have four features. Rights are natural. They are not invented or created by governments. Rights are universal. They don't change from country to country. Rights are equal. It is the same for our people, irrespective of gender, gender, race, and handicap or physical condition. And rights are inalienable, which means that I cannot hand over my rights to another person, such as by selling myself into slavery. So you see that rights are universal, natural, equal, and inalienable. Americans or Chinese people don't have much right to life and health and liberty than we Filipinos because regardless of your race, regardless of your nationality, whether you're a Filipino, a Chinese, an American, French, or whatever, we have equal rights according to John Locke. prominent philosopher who formulated a duty theory is Immanuel Kant. He emphasized a single principle of duty and he argued that we have moral duties to oneself and others such as developing our talents. That's the duty that we owe to ourselves and keeping our promises to others. That's one of the duties, moral duties, that we have to others. That if we promise to love one and only one person, then we have to keep such promise. The duty theory of Immanuel Kant is called the categorical imperative. Now, what is the categorical imperative? Under categorical imperative, there is a certain obligation to do an act not based on emotion, but based on reason. In other words, it is reason that should see or realize the inherent importance of doing something good. For example, you may do something good because you want to gain recognition or reward. But you may also do something good because you see the reason that it should be done, even if you don't gain reward or recognition at all. Now, the first example, you do good because you want to gain praise and recognition, is what Kant calls as hypothetical imperative. You do this because you want to have this, or you, you do this because you want to experience this. The, the reason for doing something good is external to the act itself. And that is hypothetical imperative. And hypothetical imperative is contrary to categorical imperative. Categorical imperative is the principle of duty or the, the, the duty theory of Immanuel Kant. Now, what is categorical imperative? It is doing something good because reason tells you that there is a good purpose or a good reason to do so. You do something good because doing good is good in itself. You do good not because you want to be praised, you want to gain recognition, but you do good because doing good is good in itself, even if you are not rewarded or praised by other people. 
Because the tendency, if we do good, because we want to gain recognition, the danger with that is, if we do good, yet we don't gain recognition anymore, then we stop doing good. But the best thing with categorical imperative is, you keep on doing good, even if no one recognizes your work or praises what you have done. And that, for Immanuel Kant, is the principle of duty. That doing good is our ultimate duty to ourselves and to others. Kant gives at least four versions of categorical imperative, but one is especially direct. That is, treat people as an end and never as a means to an end. We should not use people for our own selfish interest and dismiss them we don't, when we don't or when, or when we can't use them anymore. So using people as means for our own selfish interest is against the principle of duty. You make friends with people who have money because you want them or you want to borrow money from them if you have no money at all. So that is an example of treating people not as end but as means or as instrument for your own interest or your own gain. And that is, that is we should always treat people with dignity and never use them as mere instruments. When you just have a breakup with someone else, it may be painful and some of us will rush to have a relationship with another person because we want to use that person to replace the emptiness that we feel inside even if we don't have feelings for that person. And so we are indirectly using that person as an instrument for our own self-benefit even if we don't love that person at all. It is the, the accidental Samaritan which I was saying a while ago and if we will let duty theorists answer this question they will choose A that you have to confess your responsibility that you wouldn't be able to live with the guilt of an innocent person being in jail for a crime you committed. Another philosopher under duty theories is William David Ross. Our duties are part of the fundamental nature of the universe. That part of the state of affairs in the universe is the existence of duties. The duties are inherently natural in the universe and in the lives of human persons. Ross list of duties is much shorter but it reflects our actual moral convictions. First duty is fidelity to the duty to keep promises. This is the duty that all must uh, must follow especially for for married couples. Married couples promised or they made a vow in the altar to love each other in sickness or in health, in richer or in poorer, till death do they part. So they should keep that promise. Reparation is another duty, the duty to compensate others when we harm them. And then gratitude, the duty to thank those who help us. Justice is the duty to recognize merit. Beneficence is the duty to improve the conditions of others. 
Self-improvement is the duty to improve our virtue and intelligence. And non-maleficence is the duty not to injure or not to harm others. And Ross recognizes that situations will arise, will arise when we must choose between two conflicting duties. For example, suppose I borrow my neighbor's gun and promise to return it when he asks for it. One day, in a fit of rage, my neighbor pounds on my door and asks for the gun so that he can take vengeance on someone. So the situation or the scenario is you borrow a gun from your neighbor and one day your neighbor pounds on your door and asks you to return the gun because he wants to kill someone. Now the question, are you going to return the gun? Knowing that if you, you return the gun, it will be used by your neighbor to kill someone else. So that scenario displays the conflict between fidelity and non-maleficence. Fidelity is the duty to keep promises. You promise to return the gun. So that's fidelity. But you also have the duty not to injure others. Even if you are not the one who will kill the other person, but by letting or by, by returning the gun to your neighbor and by letting him use that gun to kill, to kill someone else, then you participate in the murder. And so, there is a tendency that you violate the duty to injure others. But common sense will tell us that in certain situations, we have to weigh things out. Which duty should we follow when duties conflict with each other? In this case, fidelity is or should prevail that non, no, non maleficence should prevail over fidelity. Yes, that is.